Oh, g'day folks, uh, welcome to church today. There's a real question, why are there so many denominations? And if knowing Jesus is all that matters, who cares what else you know about God or what else you know about Jesus? Well, St. John, uh, in his uh, Revelation Trumpets vision, by the time it comes to the third trumpet, he says, just be careful and beware, because the same ideas that led the children of Israel astray so that they became so afraid of God, they even ended up in idolatry, they even ended up turning their backs on God, and it was because of the false beliefs that they ended up having about God. And St. John in his third trumpet says, beware, be careful, because beliefs actually do matter. And some beliefs that humans may hold erroneously could give them an idea that God is a God of vengeance and anger and wrath and he's to be afraid of. And some folks then throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, God, I want nothing to do with you ever again. Uh, we're going now to the book of Revelation. I'd like you to take your um, Bible in your hands. Revelation is easy to find. It's um, the last book of the Holy Bible. So just get a Bible there. If you're new to this, it's okay. We're going straight to the uh, first one third of the book of Revelation. So if this is your first time looking at Revelation, I do hope you will enjoy the journey. Revelation chapter 8. And uh, we're looking here at verse number 10. ten. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> and I'm going to get uh, Ken to read this for us. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 10 and 11. And this is the vision that John had when a third trumpet blows and he gives a warning. The third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Mm. Uh, before we begin and get stuck into this, I just want you to notice one numeric matter, and that is... Only one third. It's not complete. It's not yes. universal. Yeah. Are you a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of guy? It doesn't I'm matter a, what you answer. No, I'm a glass with water in it. <laughs> <laughs> I do. What about you? Are you a glass half full or a glass half empty? Well, you can see that this doesn't sound very good because pure water is going to be made bitter. It's not a very good thing, but it's only going to affect one third. A really positive way of looking at this passage would be to say... Two-thirds is fine. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> no matter what the devil tries to do to the pure water of God, two-thirds of all the wonderful springs from where you can find God's water of life are still fresh and bubbling up. I think that sounds good, don't you reckon? And it says we need to be discerning, mm. not just to accept... Yeah. ...without saying, well, which is this? I want to take you back to the land of Israel, and we're looking here at the uh, Dead Sea. And again, it was just remarkable to be able to climb the Dead Sea, 600 feet below sea level in God's land, the land of Israel, where Jesus himself walked 2,000 years ago. And uh, 600 feet below sea level is this Dead Sea, which means that the rain that falls on the heights and the plateaus of Israel squeezes and squishes its way through the clay and the rock and it will bubble out as freshwater springs in this desert environment surrounding the Dead Sea. And that spring comes from the uh, Dead Sea, and it's on the side, way up high in the hills beside the Dead Sea. It's still below sea level, but that water's fallen on the plateaus of Israel, filtered through the rocks, and it bubbles up pretty well eternally. St. John saw, as you read, Ken, and just have a look at it on the screen, you were hopefully reading in your Bible, how a great star fell from the sky, burned like a torch, it fell on one third of all those fresh springs of water. And uh, when it fell on them, it made one third of them bitter. And uh, here we have a, uh, a sculpture of a fallen angel, not necessarily, ne necessarily Lucifer but, uh, or Satan, but the artist in the year 1877 read uh, John Milton's very famous work, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, and uh, this is in Madrid, in Spain. You can go to the, uh, it's a famous sculpture in Madrid. 
You can go there and see it today. Well, it's not Plaster of Paris, as you can see, because there was a, um, uh, he entered into a competition and they required it to be in iron. And that, that is why we can see it today. In Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 11, what was the name uh, of the star? In my one, it says Wormwood. Wormwood. Have you ever tasted Wormwood? Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. Uh, you don't want to know. Oh, where did you try it? Uh, we had some growing somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very bitter. Oh, it's very, it is very bitter. Very bitter. Oh, it's bitterness personified. Yeah, it's like the water of the Dead Sea. You don't want to get it in your mouth. Oh. <laughs> and uh, this star is called Wormwood or called Bitterness. It's as if the star is bitterness personified. And uh, it sounds like there's been a bit of a war and somebody has become very bitter because they've lost and the star's falling down. Now, uh, it said it made one third of the water bitter and people would die because they drank the bitter water. Um, we're going to look at what the water uh, is a symbol of and who this star is first, but um, beliefs matter. Right beliefs protect us. Mm -hmm. You can go to heaven with the wrong belief. But it can make the journey a lot more unpleasant. Yes. Well, you could be tempted to throw the baby out with the bathwater because you end up believing God hates you when in fact he loves you. That would be so sad, wouldn't it? But it's happened mm. regularly. Yeah, throughout history. Um, and well, you can't blame them. If that's what they think God is like, then the obvious thing to do is not want to have to do anything with him. Well, it happens today, right now, while we're talking. Mm. Uh, there's um, folks that get abused when they're young by people they trust and they think if God allows that, mm -hmm. if angels are real and my guardian angel did nothing, I'm not going to serve a God like that. You mean he doesn't care what I go through? And if the abuse was by their dad, mm -hmm. and the Bible talks about God as our father, then it's not a real pleasant image. It can take a lifetime of a journey mm -hmm. to come to a different understanding about God sometimes, can't it? We're going a little bit on that journey today. That's talking about something that's a very hard topic. And um, I wasn't talking about that just because it's an easy or a trite or I don't want to make it a trite thing. But um, what people believe matters. How we end up believing what we believe, sometimes it's uh, outside of our own control. Uh, the terrible things that happen. It can be humans. It can be, God forbid, pastors or priests. And uh, people who tell us things about God or things that we come to an understanding about God from our life experience, and we end up full of the same bitterness that twisted the being behind those beliefs at the beginning. I'd like to do what Jesus did right now, and let's lay the blame right where it belongs. <laughs> the Bible does speak about a war between good and evil, and the Bible says sometimes you and I are collateral damage. And... Uh, the war began not on earth but in heaven. And the war began as Milton's Paradise Lost goes and describes. The war began as a war between angels, some of whom rebelled against God and some of whom stayed loyal to him. And in this great war between good and bad angels, there was a leader of the rebels and his name was Lucifer. And uh, in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 13 and 14, Ken's found it for us. Um, it describes this rebellious being as having been in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. It says, you were in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, emerald and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed cherub till unrighteousness was found in you. Oh. Well, in Isaiah, it goes and writes a little bit more about this angel. And uh, in Isaiah 14 and verse number 12, if you found Ezekiel in your Bible, we're turning back here to Isaiah. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low? You've been thrown down to earth from heaven, you who destroyed the nations. Jesus said very, very clearly through the words of the Holy Bible, 
Now, the God of the universe has made plain there is somebody behind everything that's wrong. Uh, there is a great being. We are collateral damage in a great war and uh, the destroyer of the nations and the destroyer of human lives. Things may have happened to you or I through different circumstances in life, but the reason behind, the reason behind, the reason behind, there's a war, there's a context, there's a battle between good and evil. God in this battle is a God of goodness and love and light. And the whole purpose of the Holy Bible is to show you, show you reasons why you can trust the love of God. Jesus in Luke 10 and verse number 18 said very plainly, so he didn't use symbols here, disciples are returning to Jesus in the verse before and they're saying, wow, Jesus, you sent us out, sent us out with your story and people are listening and even demons have been cast out. They listen to us. Wow, Jesus, this is amazing. We're powerful, they're saying. Jesus said, well, <coughs> I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven to earth, Jesus said. Look, I've given you authority over the power of the enemy. Nothing will injure you. But verse number 20, don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Don't rejoice about miracles. Don't rejoice about supernatural stuff. Rejoice instead because your name is written in the books of heaven. The danger of rejoicing about miracles and wonderful things happening is life doesn't go like that every single day. It's good to be happy about a wonderful thing. But if you base your belief in God because you're on your level of happiness, what are you going to do when you go through a sad time in life? So Jesus said, be careful. Rejoice instead that no matter what happens, your name is found written in heaven. But Jesus, as he's headed towards this point, says, yeah, I tossed Lucifer out of heaven. I saw Satan fall like a star, like lightning, a shining bit of light from heaven to earth. But what about this uh, water that became bitter? So we're going to go back together to the land of Egypt. And as we go back there, we're going to discover some of the stories of the early Israelites. God told Moses to do this. Uh, Pharaoh said, the people of Israel will never be allowed to leave. They're my slaves. And uh, Moses says, well, God told me you are to let my people go. Pharaoh said back, well, who is God that I should worship him? They're going to remain slaves. And so then Moses lifts up his rod and the Nile River in the very first plague is struck. And as the Nile River is struck with this pollution, uh, all the rivers, canals, ponds and reservoirs are all turned to blood in the land of Egypt. And the water became so foul that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. All the Egyptians then had to, and this is the wonderful point, Ken, because you'd die without water. Yeah, in fairly short order. Yeah. And so the Nile has been turned to blood, the story goes. The river, the, the, the springs of water and the wells have all been turned to blood. So there's polluted water everywhere. But people could still drink because they dug. And where did they dig? Beside the river. <laughs> they didn't travel far. You know, there's folks that say church is a place that's full of hypocrites. There's no way I'm going near. My friend, if you're looking for Jesus, church isn't a bad place to start. And when they couldn't find the purest water in the River Nile, they dug beside the bank of the Nile and there they dug up the pure water so they could keep on drinking and supply the needs of their families. This was both Israelis and Egyptians. God loved everybody everywhere. Even the Pharaoh who rebelled against him could drink the water that his servants dug up beside the Nile. You know, God often provides a way of escape when we're going through great difficulties and troubles in life. But sometimes we have to look a little bit harder and dig a little bit deeper. Well, the children of Israel ended up escaping. And the second story about the uh, bitter water uh, or waters that became bitter is found as they're leaving the land of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They're on the other side in the Sinai Desert. Now, the desert is very, very hot. And uh, as they're traveling for three days, they couldn't find water. And uh, they're as thirsty as anything. And they start yelling at God. Well, they eventually find an oasis. And how sure. would you imagine this? And um, Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea. They moved out into the desert of Shur. And they came to their oasis of Mara. But 
And you just got to put yourself in this story. The water was too bitter <laughs> to drink. That's terrible. You can visit what they believe is still the oasis at Mara, where the uh, people of Israel uh, received some water, but it was bitter. What will Moses do? They're complaining mightily to Moses, and uh, God told Moses to top down a tree and uh, throw a bit of the tree in, and the water miraculously was made fresh. Somehow or other, the water became fresh and clean again, and they could drink from it. This is one of the wells at Mara. And um, would you drink that water, Ken? Mm, I would want to filter it and boil it and do lots of other things to it. <laughs> That's just dreadful, isn't it? <laughs> so, this is at the Oasis. There's still a couple of wells around there. And uh, when I visited, it was a hot day. Well, you can see this is our photo. Uh, it was a hot, dusty day. And that's what the water looked like. At the Nile, the waters became polluted at God's command. But Pharaoh and the people could still dig to find fresh water. God provided a way of escape. At Mara, after going across the Red Sea, the Israelites are now in the wilderness, in the desert. They've run out of water. The water's bitter. God once again provides a way of escape. He, this case, he makes the waters fresh again. Now, God draws out a point, a picture, a metaphor. It's a parable with a point. And this is the point that God makes as a result of this fresh water coming from the bitterness of Mara. Thanks, Ken. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. And there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. This is just after they um, tried to drink the bitter water. And you think, what? We go from bitter water to talking about God's laws and his instructions and how good it is if we obey them and follow them. God begins to make a bit of a link here between water and his teachings and his instructions. It's not on the screen, but in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses is singing a last song to the children of Israel. And he says, God's teachings, God's instructions, they fall like rain upon the earth. And so God's words cover the whole earth and God has many words. When we listen to God's many words falling like rain upon the whole earth, uh, that's what makes the grass grow green and that's what refreshes our hearts. The word and the instructions of God. God begins to link that with uh, this water. Did the Israelites listen to God's instructions? For a little while. Yeah. <laughs> and then the nation as a whole? On and off, uh, as, the, as the leader was. Mm. Often. But, but even when you had Ahab, mm. who would say, oh, that was bad, God said, yeah, but there's still 7,000 that are following me. Following me. So mm. it's like you were saying, it, it's not a complete thing. It's a portion. And uh, when Israel disobeyed God, uh, God warned them through the prophets, uh, Jeremiah, he said, watch out, if you continue to disobey me, I won't be able to protect you when that happens and uh, you lose your natural defence, which is my ability to protect the Babylonian king will come. Nebuchadnezzar came and he razed Jerusalem to the ground. He would burn it with fire. And God said through the prophet Jeremiah, this has happened. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Jeremiah lived through these terrible things. This has happened, God said, because my people abandoned my instructions. They refused to obey what I said. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar raised King Solomon's temple. And the walls of Jerusalem were all broken down. And uh, Daniel ends up going to Babylon as a uh, captive. Uh, but he's one of God's faithful people and he stays true to God. And he's actually protected in Babylon. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and um, Jeremiah the prophet continues to write and says, Look, the people have stubbornly followed their own desires. They've worshipped the images of Baal as their ancestors taught them. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says. Look, I'll feed them with bitterness. I'll give them poison to drink. What was this bitterness and this poison? 
Well, we need to keep reading. God says, I'll scatter them around the world in places that their ancestors have never heard of. And the Lord said, this will happen, this bitterness, because my people abandoned my instructions. It's all about the word of God. God's holy Bible contains instructions and many, many words. So many words. It's a big book, isn't it? It's like the rain falling. And uh, there's so much to study and to read. And God says, hey, look, if you delve deep and you discover and you learn and you find, you're going to discover I'm a God of love. You'll find a new reason for hope in this world, no matter what is happening around about. Well, the Lord replies, my people refuse to obey what I said. So who led Israel astray? God said it was the prophets. They were supposed to be telling his word to the people. And instead, they were twisting God's word and leading them astray. Religious leaders leading ordinary people astray. And so God said, I'll feed them with bitterness and I'll give them poison to drink. It's because of Jerusalem's prophets that, w- that wickedness has filled this land. Well, that was the history of ancient Israel. And uh, John said in the New Testament era, at the beginning of the Christian church, a third trumpet blows and Satan falling like lightning from heaven down to earth as seen by Jesus will come down and what he will do is he will touch the waters the wonderful teachings and the instructions and the messages of Jesus, and he'll turn them into bitterness. I'm here at Miletus, Ken, and I know you visited Turkey. Yes. And at Miletus, uh, we took this picture of the uh, theatre, and uh, Miletus is not a very famous biblical town. It's only mentioned a few times. But St Paul stopped at this uh, port city on his travels, And he's just about to go to Jerusalem and then Rome where he's going to die. And so it's his last missionary journey. And at Miletus, it's a little bit close to Ephesus, a day or two's walk. And he said, leaders of the church in Ephesus, I want you to come to Miletus and meet me. I've got something I want to tell you. And responding doesn't mean catching a plane. Responding means you set out for a two or a three day walk. So you walk down because St. Paul is in Miletus. Maybe you're staying close to this great ancient theatre here um, in the paddocks of modern Turkey. And um, Ken, you were were in Ephesus. I was. Mm. Apart from the theatre, it looked very much the same. Oh, it looks similar to uh, Miletus, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, (laughs) That that plain, the the harbour used to come right in here, but it's all filled in and the the sea's now back a little bit. Yeah. In Ephesus, the theatre is a whole lot bigger. Yeah. 25,000, I think, it seats. Yeah, a lot of pagans in Paul's day, weren't they? Well, they, lo- they like their theatre. Yeah, they like the theatre. <laughs> Miletus had a theatre too. He calls for the elders, and this is what St. Paul said to the elders uh, in verse number uh, 17 and onwards. Ken, if you could read for us. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, Be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease, night or day, to admonish every one of you of tears. Mm. I just want you to imagine that you were there and you're one of the leaders of the Ephesian church. It was a tiny church in a a city that did not follow God. And uh, from this tiny church comes the elders uh, down to see St. Paul. And they're standing around him in a circle and Paul says, I'm going to leave, I'm going to die in Rome. And this is my last message to you. You'd be listening, wouldn't you? It's a fairly serious moment. Yeah, this is St. Paul. And his last message is, guard the flock, be faithful. Sounds pretty good so far, doesn't it? Then he looks you in the eyes, he goes around the circle, just like Jesus said to his disciples and Judas was amongst them, one of you will betray me. Paul has the same message to those first group of elders in the church at Ephesus. And he says, some of you will betray 
Jesus like Judas. Some of you will twist the words of God. Some of you will turn the fresh, pure water of the word of God and make it bitter. And you'll be twisting the words of God in order to make yourself more powerful and to draw away disciples after yourself. And the sad news of the Christian church in the New Testament era is that the New Testament church ended up following the same similar paths as the Old Testament church of God in the Old Testament, these ancient Israelis. Mm -hmm. It's true, isn't it? Yep. And um, powerful popes wanting to get power and money for themselves do terrible things. That's the story of Christianity. Bishops would sometimes be corrupt. Monks and nuns would sometimes twist truth, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. The medieval ages will dawn in the Reformation era. Um, some Protestant leaders go and become powerful and corrupt as well. Isn't that the story? In every single denomination around the entire world, every single church, there are going to be people that... Go off the way. Yeah, they do. And Paul said, be careful, watch out, guard yourselves. And, oh, please, let it not be you or I. But behind the church or corruption is another great being and Jesus lays the blame squarely at that being's feet and says, a great star falling from heaven will hit the waters, the teachings of Jesus, and one third of them will be turned into bitterness. That's a pretty powerful prediction of sadness in church. But it's better to be warned ahead of time than for it to happen without warning. Yeah. We're not talking about it today, but we are going to uh, spend a little bit of time exploring this over the next few weeks. And, um, but um, uh, as the church begins its journey with Jesus, who is now in heaven, and the New Testament era has dawned, uh, the church was very careful to distinguish itself first from the non-believing Jewish folks that didn't believe Jesus was Messiah and second from the pagan Greeks or the, the Greek influence of the Roman Empire. Now walking a bit of a tightrope here and the early church over the first few centuries was so careful to say no we're not Jewish that they uh, disregarded Sabbath and uh, ended up worshipping on a very regular basis which is fine because you can worship seven days a week but they would worship on the day of the sun in memory of Jesus' resurrection. And uh, they did this so regularly, they ended up forgetting about Sabbath. And, you know, I think we can almost understand why they did it. Mm. Because from the Old Testament times, the Jewish people had been a rebellious lot. Mm. They'd rebelled against the Romans. Mm. You know, in 70 AD, the Romans come and destroyed Jerusalem. And you get ongoing rebellion still. And down in Alexandria and Egypt, the Romans didn't distinguish between Jews and Christians. They all worshipped on Sabbath. And so the Christians tried to make themselves look a little bit less like mm -hmm. their Jewish neighbours. Yeah. And so they began, you know, keeping Sunday. And maybe we can understand. It doesn't make it right, but we can understand the motivation that led to it. Yes, well, I enjoy preaching on Sundays and I enjoy worshipping on Wednesdays when we have Bible studies. But um, they forgot Sabbath. Mm. And uh, the problem with that was three or 400 years later, instead of it just being a theological thing, it became a uh, belief that resulted in great oppression because the uh, Roman Emperor Constantine and the emperors following him ended up making laws saying you must quit uh, doing normal activities on Sunday. And the church and the emperor assumed the power to tell people what they should or should not do on a particular day. Now, God has left it up to individuals to decide to love him of their own free will. But when the church and the empire did this, uh, they did it for political reasons, for reasons of power, and oppression resulted. Uh, but the bitterness was not seen at the very beginning. Uh, as the Greeks... Uh, entered the Christian church, they brought with them the idea that um, a human body wasn't just a body, it was a body and it was had a, 
couple of different natures. There was a soul. It was a little bit hard to comprehend what the Greeks were saying. The philosophers would argue, but that although the body dies, that the soul lives for eternity. Well, it's just echoing something that's biblical from the very beginning, isn't it? Mm. But the first lie that Satan told, mm. you won't die. Yeah. And if that's true, who needs God? Yeah. So take me back there, Ken. This is a pretty powerful point. Um, the first lie of the great star who would make the waters bitter on planet Earth was... It was told to Adam and Eve by a serpent in a tree. Repeated by a priest or a pastor at a funeral service when folks agree you've been saying, your loved one's not really dead. They're immortal and their soul lives on. That was the devil's first lie. Now, at the very beginning, this didn't taste bitter. It tasted rather sweet at a funeral service. Oh, our loved one is still continuing. Except, as the centuries go by, bitterness results as people start to stop and ponder. But hang on, the Bible talks about a last fire, a destruction. The Bible does refer to hell at the end of the day. It does. And that means if the soul lives on forever and ever and ever and ever, hell must go on forever and ever and ever and ever for those... Well, God can't kill you. God can't kill you? All he can do is make you uncomfortable for a very long time. Yeah, I'll tell you, this thought became so scary that people tried to get their infants, their, ba their babies, baptised as soon as they could so they could escape from the world of hell and enter into God's kingdom. They, they became so afraid of God, they thought that if their baby wasn't baptised, God wouldn't take their baby to heaven. Shocking, doctor. What, what kind of God does that make God? It's a shocking thought. Abusive, uh, actually. Uh, very abusive. Well, by the time of the medieval the era, yeah. In the medieval era, we have uh, Martin Luther. And Martha Luther said that the, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul that, re, that, that results in an eternal torment, everlasting hellfire, that that idea comes from the dung hill of medieval Christian beliefs and does not not have a part in the Bible. And Martin Luther said, God is not like that. And he nailed five statements about that thought to the door of Wittenberg and to of the cathedral in Wittenberg. That was one of the thoughts that began the Reformation. The Pope and his men at the time were saying, pay us some money and then we will get a forgiveness given to you for your loved one's soul and the soul will escape purgatory and won't go to hell. And so the peasants of Germany are, are afraid. So Ken, I guess that's about the story of Christianity. It went through a similar path to the people of the Old Testament times. It, it didn't. There's probably other examples we could explore of yeah. how this bitterness, this poison came into the water of Christianity. Yes, and it didn't uh, make it bitter straight away, did it? It, took, it was a progressive it thing. It was a process. And coming up is probably going to be a process too. Yes. Folks, you know, I stood in uh, Switzerland at, uh, the, uh, at the, in Basel at the um, uh, crossroads and there's a statue there of Voltaire, uh, the Swiss philosopher, and he said, there's no way I could ever believe in a God who would torture people for trillions of years for a few short years of sin and rebellion on earth. And so Voltaire would throw the baby out with the bathwater. You see, beliefs do matter. And uh, over the next few weeks, we're just going to be exploring some of the beliefs of, uh, of Christianity and checking them against the Bible. I uh, do hope that you come on this journey with us. You see, what you believe about life does matter. What you believe about God does matter. Is he a God of love? Is he a God who hates a neighbour who doesn't want to follow him? Is he a God who forgives? Is he a God who can protect? Is he a God who, if bad things happen, will somehow rescue? Is there another war behind the scenes so that what you and I face sometimes from day to day isn't necessarily completely our fault or it's just things that happened or where was God? What if God's own hands sometimes are tired and he cries because he just wished he could and he can't? We're going to be exploring some of these thoughts over the next few weeks. Thanks, Ken, for being and helping me today. It's a pleasure. Right here. Yeah. And uh, we're leaving the Dead Sea in Israel behind and uh, next week we're going to be looking at the beginning of the Christian church. 
And we look at the beginning of the Christian church, it begins there in the land of Israel. And of course, it will begin with the freshest, purest, clearest streams of water, the words of instruction, the words of life from the Bible. May God be with you until we see each other again.